Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So as promised, today we have planned our Marcel Proust video. Now, just to give you guys an idea of how to approach Proust or what you're going to be dealing with. When we're talking about Marcel Proust, here's just an example. Uh, this is the first volume right here. Not that big of a deal, right? Uh, but this is all one series that you will encounter with Marcel Proust. This is known as In Search of Lost Time. Uh, the French translation is A la Recherche de Temps Pardu. Uh, I don't have to worry too much about the French translation. Uh, but if you know any French, it definitely comes in handy when you're reading Marcel Proust, obviously. Uh, he was a French writer. We'll talk a little bit about Proust himself. Um, the first volume is called Swan's Way. Marcel Proust was born in 1871. His father was a fairly prominent doctor that was involved in something called uh, epidemiology. Not real familiar with that, but his mother was a Jew, so he sort of had the, um, the, the, the converging of cultures there. Uh, Marcel Proust faced a little bit of anti-Semitism, uh, but he was also sort of a privileged individual, right? So uh, he sort of saw both the, you know, the, the best and the worst of, of both worlds or lots of different worlds. Um, he was not an, uh, he, he, he wasn't like a, a royal citizen, but he was sort of a bourgeoisie, sort of aristocrat, I guess you could say. Um, and throughout his life, he attempted to sort of work his way up the social hierarchy, um, not only for his writing and also for his, you know, social connections, but also as we read about in Swan's Way as a way to uh, sort of find the meaning of life, but he does not find the meaning of life in uh, social class or social hierarchy or social status or money or anything like that. Um, and basically, when we're dealing with uh, In Search of Lost Time, a la Recherche de Temps Pardu, we're basically dealing with an omnipresent narrator, which is Proust himself, uh, but the story is not really focused on the narrator's life like you would get with a traditional novel like something like Ernest Hemingway or Thomas Wolfe or Dostoevsky or something like that or Leo Tolstoy. Uh, I guess it's a little more like Leo Tolstoy because it, it it's less focused on, there's more like an omnipresent narrator. And I guess like War and Peace, for example, we never really know who the narrator is. Obviously, it's Tolstoy, but... In this case, it's obviously Marcel Proust, um, very brilliant, introspective narrator, um, but it's not sort of a first-person type of story, mind you, if that makes sense. Yeah, it is basically what we what we're learning about with Marcel Proust is we learn about ourselves and we learn about the narrator through the impressions and the reactions. Uh, from the other characters, basically. I'm just going to get my notes because uh, there's some things I need to address. There's some things I need to address with Proust here. Um, so we talked a little bit about Proust, you know, upbringing. He was definitely not poor. He was definitely on the upper echelon of the social hierarchy. He did go to some type of college. Uh, but he lived off of his father's inheritance. His father was very wealthy. and He was very, very... Um, had a very close-knit relationship with his mother that you learn about um, basically in the first section of the book or even in the first couple of pages. Something called the Goodnight Kiss um, that came from Marcel Proust's mother. Um, and maybe there's a little Freudian, you know, sort of uh, rabbit hole you could potentially go down there with his relationship with his mother. But baby Marcel Proust did not want to go to bed without that exchange that midnight kiss from his mother there's a lot of anxiety there maybe separation anxiety some type of um, overnight anxiety and he has to have that you know final kiss that good night exchange with his mother and then his father kind of comes upstairs and, and says you know you got to stop coddling this child so we sort of have that um, and that's kind of where the beginning of, 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 you know, Swan's Way starts. And you might be asking, why is it called Swan's Way? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but also, we talked about, the, you know, how the fact that the story unfolds um, through the impressions and the reactions of other people, right? Um, it's not like a Charles Bukowski book where it's like, I woke up, 
I walk down the street, blah, blah, blah. It's much more sort of universal in the sense of how everybody else's impressions and everybody else's interactions influence the narrators, right? Um, but in addition to that, we have Marcel Proust has a real strong uh, affinity for time, memory, uh, feelings and impressions and what they mean over the course of his life as well as the characters um, and the lives of all the people that we're hearing about. And, and how does time trigger memory? How does memory trigger time? Um, and how does emotions, um, how does emotion sort of, what triggers the emotions to make you think about time? Um, and also, yeah, like we said earlier, there's an emphasis on how we, emphasis on how we learn about ourselves through the observations and impressions uh, through those of others. Um, childhood feelings and later into adolescence, uh, then we see how art, music, and writing, as well as nature, influence Proust's view of the world. Um, that's something else to be aware of with Marcel Proust. Uh, you'll definitely want to annotate with Proust, like you see me doing here. That's only a small handful, definitely much more annotations as we go along. I definitely recommend using the sticky notes so you can really just, um, you know, write down the main points that have stood out to you. Um, we have some pen marks in here as well that come in handy. I'll show you some annotations we made just recently uh, that are good. Um, I just sort of like the juxtaposition of pen with the highlighter. I don't really like to do a lot of annotations with pen in here because it's not very accurate and you end up drawing all over the lines and just messing it up. I know some people are really into pen, uh, but for me, pen annotations rather, but for me, it's all about the highlighter for the main points. And then of course you can jot down your thoughts in pen, but I don't really recommend annotating in the margins with pen because it just becomes a complete mess. And that's kind of part of the fun of it, right? So anyway, we're getting a little off track, but going back to Marcel Proust here, um, we have something called the Proustian moment. And that um, encompasses what I'm talking about. And let me just find it and we'll talk about that. Okay, so page 61 of, of this particular translation of Swan's Way. Now, just in case anybody's curious, this is the Modern Library Edition, translated by C.K. Scott Montecrief and Terence Kilmartin, revised by blah, blah, blah. Has translators, has two translators, one reviser, and, and then somebody else that wrote the introduction. And then finally, you get to Marcel Proust. So what we have here is the famous Proustian moment. You guys might be asking yourself, what the hell is a Proustian moment? Well, we're going to read it to you here. Uh, many years had elapsed during which nothing of Cambrai, that's where this story takes place in Cambrai in France, except what lay in the theater and the drama of my going to bed there had any existence for me. When one day in winter on my return home, my mother, seeing that I was cold, offered me some tea, a thing I did not ordinarily take. I declined at first and then for no particular reason changed my mind. She sent for one of those squat, plump little cakes called Petite Madelines. You guys might know what those are. You see them in the supermarkets. They look like little seashells. Uh, she sent for one of those Madelines, which look as though they had been molded in the fluted valve of a scalloped shell. And soon, mechanically, dispirited after a dreary day with the prospect of a depressing tomorrow, I raised to my lips a spoonful of the tea in which I had soaked a morsel of the cake. No sooner had the warm liquid mixed with the crumbs touched my palate than a, than a shiver ran through me and I stopped intent upon the extraordinary thing that was happening to me. An exquisite pleasure had invaded my senses, something isolated, detached, with no suggestion of its origin. And at once the vicissitudes of life, I think I'm butchering that word, had become indifferent to me, its disasters innocuous, its brevity illusionary, this new sensation having had the effect which love has of filling me with a precious essence, or rather this essence was not in me, it was me. I had ceased now to feel mediocre, contingent, or mortal. Whence could it have come to me this all-powerful joy? 
I sensed that it was connected with the taste of the tea and the cake, but that it indefinitely transcended those saviors. Could not indeed be the same nature. Where did it come from? What did it mean? How could I seize and apprehend it? So that's that's a lot to swallow, right? And that's what you're dealing with in Rousseau Proust. Really, really long sentences, almost no periods. Um, some of his sentences will go on and on for pages at a time. And by the time you get to the end of it, sometimes, you know, you have to go back and kind of redecipher what it was you just read. But once you sort of uh, get used to Marcel Proust's writing style, it's much more approachable. It seems like a lot at first, and sometimes when you first approach Marcel Proust, you'll kind of be kind of scratching your head, or maybe you'll be throwing your copy of Swan's Way across the room saying, what the hell is going on here? Why is he writing like this? But going back to the Proustian moment, he's basically writing about the sensations that we get when we're eating or drinking or when we're walking in the countryside and we smell a certain smell and it automatically transports us back to a feeling of innocence or maybe a feeling of love or a feeling um, of, of family or of nurturing energy or something like that. For Proust, um, it's the tea that he dips the petite Madeline in uh, into his tea and he's sort of transported uh, I'm not sure exactly where he goes with it here I actually got to be careful with these sticky notes because they're actually damaging my my book here so maybe you shouldn't use sticky notes uh, I drink a second mouthful he says in which I find nothing more than in the first than a third which gives me rather less than the second it is time to stop the potion is losing its virtue it is plain that the truth I am seeking lies not in the cup, but in myself. The drink has called it into being, but does not know it, and can only repeat indefinitely with a progressive diminution of strength the same messages which I cannot interpret, though I hope at least to be able to call it forth again and to find it there presently intact and at my disposal for my final enlightenment. I put down the cup and examine my own mind. It alone can discover the truth, but how? What an abyss of uncertainty whether the mind feels overtaken by itself when it, the seeker, is at the same time the dark region through which it must go seeking and where all its equipment will avail it nothing. So he's basically sort of encouraging you to respond to those sensations. When you get those recollections, when you get those memories, when you get those thoughts, uh, good or bad, investigate them because they're like mental and emotional sort of rabbit holes that can lead you into sort of unlocking the keys to yourself. So that the first part of the book is basically called Combre, and it basically documents the narrator's um, early adolescence and childhood among his upper class relationship with his parents. And we have other characters, you know, like Frank Coy's, um, and his grandmother. Um, now, I did write something here. Uh, possible overbearing incestual relationship between Proust and his mother. There's no evidence to suggest that it was incestual. That was, that was just to kind of get the thoughts out of my head. But that's a good thing when you're reading. Just how, No matter how extreme your thought process is or how revolting your thought is, just get it on paper because usually those rabbit holes have merit. Um, obviously, I don't think his relationship was incestual, but I do think it was very maybe codependent or very overly affectionate, perhaps. Uh, just little things like um, uh, concealing p pleasures that were baleful and a mortal sadness because Mama was tasting of them while I was far away had opened its doors to me and like a ripe fruit which burst through its skin was going to pour out into my intoxicated heart the sweetness of mama's attention while she was reading what I had written. Now I was no longer separated from her. The barriers were down, an exquisite thread united us. Besides, that was not all, for surely mama would come. So he's either lying in bed um, or he's looking out onto the garden where his mother is. She's talking with her family members. And, you know, like we said before, there's that sort of over that over coddling from his mother but there's the over overbearing need from the narrator to have this exchange with his mother now it's quite innocent there's really nothing wrong with it but it sort of sets up the 
introspective, overly sensitive outpouring that we get with Swan's Way, um, a la Rochelle de Tom's Purdue. The sort of the whole worldview of Marcel Proust is very sensitive. It's very overbearing. It's very responsive. It's very memory driven. It's very um, sort of driven by the sensation of how memories trigger certain feelings, how uh, how love is expressed, how anxiety is expressed. And, and also we get these beautiful, just going to check my notes here. Uh, so we talked about the nature and we talked about art. And I do want to sort of um, explain to you guys a little bit more about what I mean about the whole thing with art or music, for example. Uh, let's see if we can find this here. Okay, so when we're dealing with Marcel Proust, and especially when we get to the sort of the main protagonist, apart from Marcel Proust and his sort of immediate family, we come to know these individuals called Swan. And going back to the title, Swan's Way, Swan is a real person. I forgot his first name, uh, but he's known as Monsieur Swan or Mr. Swan. And he's sort of like a aloof, upper-class disillusioned man and but everybody kind of likes him he's very likable but he's kind of aloof and he's maybe a little bit sarcastic and he falls in love with this sort of coquettish perhaps um also aloof woman named odette and the second part of the novel after Combray, consequently is called swan in love and that's when the book kind of shifts from the omnipresent narrator's life to Swan in Love. And it doesn't just jump from the narrator's experience to somebody else's. I mean, it does, but it's still told through, an out, through the outside perspective of the omnipresent narrator. And Swan and Odette were known to Proust and his family, so we're still getting Proust's worldview, you see. That's kind of how Marcel Proust works. So even though Marcel Proust's characters are often embellished and perhaps they're not even his own, you know, they're not re directly related to his family in some ways, um, it's still told through Pr Proust's worldview. And it, they, are, they are all people that Marcel Proust or somebody in his family interacted with. I'm not sure how Proust would have gone about researching these people or how he learned so much about them or how he avoided, you know, these people getting upset or trying to sue him or something. Uh, but I think that was sort of what Proust did throughout his life was to sort of hang around and, you know, live off his father's inheritance and just sort of germ his way, sort of sneak his way up the social hierarchy and sort of smooge. Marcel Proust must have done a lot of schmoozing and a lot of imaginative schmoozing as well. And he eventually, towards the end of his life, he got really sick. Some people claim he was more of a hypochondriac, uh, but he did not leave his house and he wrote pretty much all night long and slept during the day. And that's why we have these, you know, almost, you know, over a million pages is, is how long uh, in search of lost time is. Uh, so I interrupted myself, but, and I need to go back to that little section that we just carved out for ourselves here. Uh, so we talked about Swan and Odette, and I did mention to you guys that with Marcel Proust, uh, there, there's, a, there's definitely an emphasis on art and music. Now, those are rabbit holes. Let me see if I can just find this. What the hell happened to it? Okay, so we got, let me just mark this page here so we don't lose it. You will want to investigate those rabbit holes. Um, when Proust tells you about a certain sonata, like Moonlight Sonata, for example, everybody knows that one, right? Uh, so maybe you can skip over that one. But sometimes he will mention a certain play or a certain book or a certain painting. Now, for example, uh, what's the artist's name right here? Uh, Botticelli. Uh, Marcel Proust talks a lot about Botticelli, as well as William, uh, I think I think his first name is William, talks a lot about Botticelli and Turner, William Turner. Uh, 
Botticelli's first name is definitely not Turner. So, or <laughs> Botticelli's first name is definitely not William. So I was referring to Turner when I said William. Um, so we have people like Botticelli, Turner, uh, you know, obviously Beethoven. Um, and, and sometimes the rabbit holes that he'll send you on can be tricky because sometimes Marcel Proust will invent a certain book or he'll invent a certain piece of music or something like that. So that can be kind of tricky. And sometimes he's playing little mind games with you. But for the most part, Marcel Proust is writing about real music, real paintings. He talks a lot about the ancient carvings, um, you know, or the medieval carvings and, and the way that they, you know, talked about religion and medieval carvings and stuff like that. So there's definitely a lot to, when he gives you an example of art, it's good to investigate it. For example, she reminded, he's talking about Swan's impressions of Odette here. She reminded him even more than usual of the faces of some of the women created by the painter of the Primavera. The Primavera is a pretty famous painting by Botticelli. You guys can look that up. She had at this moment their downcast, heartbroken expression, uh, which seems ready to succumb beneath the burden of a grief too heavy to be borne when they are merrily allowing the infant Jesus to play with a pomegranate or watching Moses pour water into a trough. So whenever we're dealing with Odette, Marcel Proust, through the eyes of Swan, sort of gives you a tool to envision what Odette sort of looked like. Now, it's not an exact description, mind you, but he sort of tells us that Odette has the eyes of the ladies of the Primavera in the Botticelli painting, right? So that's kind of the brilliant way that Proust describes his characters. Um, he describes them through music. Um, he has these scenes where Swan becomes overwhelmed with the sound of a piano sonata. And we get these beautiful descriptions of how what Swan's thinking while somebody's playing the piano. Or uh, we get these descriptions of Marcel Proust when he was young. Uh, he would go into the art galleries and sort of just imagine what either the artist was feeling or he would basically go to the galleries and pick out people that he recognized in his own life through the paintings or through the sculptures. So just a brilliant celebration of the liberal arts in general and how they influence you as a person, which I think is quite fascinating. Um, so we talked a little bit about Odette and Swan. Now, their love affair is not the traditional love affair, and that's kind of what makes this book interesting. It's a very uh, sort of tortured, uh, strained, what's the word I used? Passionate and tortured love affair, because um, I don't, don't want to tell you guys exactly what happens, but it's very strained. Uh, Swan and Odette are almost like polar opposites. And Swan almost starts to become paranoid that Odette is not really that loyal to him. And it's sort of unclear why. I mean, it's not unclear why he falls in love with her, but it's almost like he has to let his guard down to really love this woman because she doesn't fit into the typical category of beauty, I guess you could say, of what he's used to. Um, but time and time again, in our own lives, as well as in literature and in music, we fall in love with people that are often maybe not our types, or they, they sort of stray from what we believe are, are our types, whatever that means. Um, so, basically with Marcel Proust, not only is the language beautiful, uh, but the characters are beautiful, um, but what you have to get past is there's sort of a lot of schmoozing, there's a lot of shit talking, there's a lot of upper class sort of stuffy, you know, snobby type of conversations. Uh, but there's interesting flashes of brilliance happening all the time. Um, and it will take several rereads. Like, for example, uh, we are on the, my second reread of Swan's Way. We're on page 410. So we only got about another 230 pages, maybe another 210 pages, and then we'll be done with our second reread of Swan's Way, and then we can move on to uh, Within a Budding Grove. And this is the second installment of A la Recherche de Temps Perdue. 
Um, and then we move on to the Gormantis way, and then we move on to Sodom and Gomorrah, and then we move on to the captive and the fugitive, and then time regained. Uh, so just by the sheer size of it and the looks of it, and also the writing style of Proust, it's kind of like Benjamin McVoy said, uh, Proust is definitely worth your time, right? But he's worth a lot of your time, you know? Uh, it's like, almost like Thomas Wolfe, but it's even more than Thomas Wolfe. You cannot blow through Marcel Proust on a weekend. You cannot do a reading challenge with Marcel Proust. I mean, I guess you could. Uh, but that's like trying to inhale a really gourmet, wonderful, beautiful meal. And you're not going to appreciate it if you try to speed read Proust. It's almost impossible to speed read Proust because he demands that you kick your feet up and grab a glass of tea or a glass of you know a cup of coffee and slow your mind down it's almost like you're taking it's almost like you're taking a, a clock and you're kind of just <coughs> going like this and you're slowing your entire life down you're 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 slowing your entire blood flow down your entire mood your entire everything down um you don't want to come to proust anxious you know you want to come to proust um with the sort of the the innocent naivety of a child and you don't want to be aloof with Proust I don't mean to be to say that but you want to be you want to be passionate and you want to be patient with Proust um I didn't I found that um I would read more from the text but I found that when I go back and watch the videos when I'm reading constantly from the text if you have if a lot of people if you haven't read from the book you know, it's kind of hard to put that in context. But let me see if I can find a a good example here just to help you guys get into Proust. Uh, you know, if I haven't already. So he's got, I mean, he's got beautiful stuff all throughout the, the board here. Um, now here he's talking about this lady named Frank Kois, I think. This was not to say, however, that she did not long at times for some greater change, that she did not experience some of those exceptional moments when one thirsts for something other than what is. And when those who, through lack of energy or imagination, are unable to generate any motive power in themselves, cry out as the clock strikes or the postman knocks. For something new, even if it is worse, some emotion, some sorrow, when the heart strings, which contentment has silenced, like a harp laid by, yearn to be plucked and sounded again by some hand, however rough, even if it should be break them when the will which has with such difficulty won the right to indulge without let or hindrance in its own desires and woes would gladly fling the reins into the hands of imperious circumstance however cruel so i wrote here beautiful emotions of frank coys to the introspection of all so that's also something you'll get with Marcel Proust is how individual feelings and reactions of characters either influence or encompass the entire feelings of humanity, right? So it is kind of hard to tackle Proust. It's hard to pinpoint Proust. You kind of have to wrestle with him, right? Um, but once you understand Proust's motives and once you understand his worldview and once you become passionate uh, about his writing and his worldview, uh, you'll, you'll really start to get a lot out of it. Uh, some of you guys might, you know, Proust might come across as kind of antiquated or old fashioned, um, which in some ways he is. Uh, but it's there's so much wonderful life advice in here and there's so much wonderful information in here. Um, you know, we talk so much about the, about the art and the music. Um, let's read this beautiful passage about love. 
This tea had indeed seemed to Swan, just as it had seemed to her, something precious, and love has such a need to find some justica justification for itself, some guarantee of duration and pleasures, pleasures, pleasures which without it would have no existence and must cease with its passing, that when he left her at seven o'clock to go and dress for the evening, all the way home in his Browman, unable to repress the happiness with which the afternoon adventures had filled him, he kept repeating to himself, how nice would it would be to have a, have a little woman like that in whose house one could always be certain of finding what one can never be certain of finding, a really good cup of tea. So, uh, if, and then uh, Odette sort of says here, if only she wrote, uh, you had also forgotten your heart, I should never have let you have that back. So we have these almost simplistic ways <coughs> and things like tea and madelines and coffee or, or even like art or music, but we learn how those things trigger larger emotions in us. It's sort of like when you throw a pebble into a lake like Benjamin McBoy talks about, and we see the ripples on the water, and it just encompasses uh, just many things uh, about life and emotions and, and love. Um, so hopefully I've inspired you guys to pick up uh, Swan's Way. Swan's Way is definitely the one you, you have to start with. I uh, don't recommend reading them out of order because you won't really understand the worldview or anything. Uh, but if you're interested in France, you're interested in the culture, uh, you know, from the 1870s going all the way up until the 1920s. Uh, Marcel Proust is a great place to start if you're interested in the upper class, if you're interested in the bourgeoisie, but also if you're interested in just art and emotion um, and just the really slow, languid, epic narrative of Marcel Proust, um, then I definitely recommend it. You know, picking up a copy of this, it's not very expensive. I think I got this for under $40, which is pretty awesome. Um, there's other translations, but I definitely recommend this translation uh, for sure. So if you guys have any questions or comments about Marcel Proust or anything that you feel I missed, uh, please let me know in the comments section. Again, uh, with A la Rochelle de Tom's Purdue, we're basically dealing with an omnipresent narrator and uh, how feelings of time and memory and emotion and love um, are experienced by not only the narrator but also the larger social class of Marcel Proust's universe um, and also the tensions between the sexes you know we have the the, the sort of the tough um, strained pas but passionate love affair between Odette and Swan and then the, the, the sort of the sequence of events moves into other characters as the narrator gets older and also with Proust, you know, we are dealing with um, themes of sexuality, um, homosexuality, bisexuality, perhaps. Um, and yeah, I don't want to give too much away about Marcel Proust without you guys exploring it on your own. But hopefully this was a good introduction. And thank you so much for watching. We will talk to you guys in the next video.